Hi, Matt. Welcome to the Well Vegan Travel Podcast. Hi, Brady. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be part of the, the podcast and I'm a big fan. So thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to have you on because we're going to be talking about a part of the world that is very dear to my heart. And that is Cape Town, this incredible, vibrant, interesting city. But uh, before we get into all of the great value that you're going to give our listeners, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story about why you ended up in Cape Town? Because for listeners who have a very keen ear, they might be able to tell that you are not South African from birth. How did you end up in Cape Town? Absolutely. So I've lived in Cape Town for the past 12 years. I'm originally from the UK and I'm an actor. And I was living and working in London and um, I got to like kind of like my early 30s and I was wanting to stay in my industry, but at the same time, I wanted to have like a life adventure. So I was planning to go to Los Angeles because it seemed like the most obvious place for an actor to kind of go, especially English speaking actor. So I was kind of like working towards making all of this happen. And then it, I was on a job with a South African and I was telling her about my plans and everything. And I was having some visa trouble as well and trying to navigate that in terms of going to America and stuff. And she said to me, have you ever considered Cape Town? And I said, outside of visiting for a holiday, no, why? And she said, you know, there's quite an industry there for actors. There's a, there's a film studio that's just been built just outside of Cape Town. This was in 2010. And she says, you know, there's a big uh, seasonal uh, commercial industry there. And that was basically the end of the conversation. But it, there was something about that very brief interaction that completely just piqued my interest. So I went home that night. I went on to Google. I tried to find as much as I can about actors and acting in South Africa. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to take a 10-day trip and I'm just going to throw caution to the wind and I'm just going to come to Cape Town and see what happens. I came down to Cape Town and I met with a couple of agents and they offered me representation. But aside from that, I just absolutely fell in love with the city. There was just something so immediate about it. It was just an energy, I suppose, that I just, just resonated with me. Also, the weather coming from the UK, um, where you're kind of never really in summer, but you're never really out of winter. And it's this kind of always... You know, I know there's a lot going on in the world at the moment with weather patterns. But yes, there was something immediate about it just being in this African sun and being in this African light that just did something to me, perhaps on a molecular level. I don't know. I can't quite explain it. There was something very instant. Yes, well, I haven't spent that much time in Cape Town, but certainly your words resonated with me. That's really how I felt when I've been in Cape Town. So you have recently set up a vegan travel business yeah. in Cape Town and you hope to share with vegan travelers the abundance that is like Cape Town and the surrounding areas, both from, you know, just a general sightseeing perspective and also from like a delicious vegan foodie perspective. So we thought that it would be fun for you to share like a three-day itinerary for exploring this incredible area. Because I think a lot of people come to South Africa for the animals and the incredible national parks, but there really is so much more just even within Cape Town and the immediate area. So tell us about what a three day itinerary for exploring Cape Town would be like. Sure, absolutely. So first of all, three days in Cape Town, your feet aren't going to touch the ground because there is just so much to explore and so much to just immerse yourself in. But of course, some, sometimes people are on a time restraint, especially if we have a lot of cruise ships that come into Cape Town as well. And sometimes they're only here for like maybe two or three days. And so, so let's assume that you only have three days in Cape Town and you've just got to absolutely make the most of it. I would split it up into three different kind of sections. And that would be probably a city tour, which will kind of incorporate a lot of the history of Cape Town. And then the second day would be like a Cape Peninsula tour. So you get to explore the coastline. Um, you'd get to explore the African penguins at Boulders Beach, as well as the Cape of Good Hope, where Cape Point is. 
Um, and then the third day, I would absolutely 100% recommend exploring the Winelands and going to Stellenbosch or Franschhoek, which are two beautiful towns, very old towns. Like Stellenbosch is the second oldest town in South Africa outside of Cape Town. And um, yeah, and basically do some wine tasting and just enjoy some of our delicious wine. What would be your preferred day one of the itinerary? So I think it would be a good introduction probably to start with the city tour because that would incorporate like uh, some of the history of the country as well as some of the history of the city. Um, so I think you, you can't come to Cape Town and not visit Table Mountain, you know. You have to try and include that in your itinerary. Um, so obviously because we're kind of short of time I would absolutely recommend taking the cable car up because it would take four to five minutes to get up there and then you can just start enjoying the views immediately obviously you cannot you know hike up there as well um, but you know it will take much longer and sometimes people aren't as fit and whatever else so that would be the first thing that I would do on my day one, especially if the weather's good. And that's an important thing to actually bear in mind as well, is that a lot of it is going to depend on the weather because we have the Southeaster here during the summer months, which is very, very windy. Um, so sometimes they close the cable car. And so, so you always keep a check on the weather if you're here for a short period of time to make sure that you can include that in your days. But let's assume that that's how you start off your day at, at going up to Table Mountain. And then from there, I'd probably go to the Castle of Good Hope. It's the oldest colonial building in South Africa, and it's steeped in history. So it's where, in 1652, uh, Jan van Riebeek set up a, a refreshment station for the Dutch East India Company when they were traveling down from the Netherlands all the way across through to India and Indonesia for, as part of the spice route. From there, obviously, I think by this time you'll probably be quite hungry, so you'd need to have some lunch somewhere and the plenty of beautiful vegan eateries or even, you know, restaurants that are offering vegan options. And then from there, I would go to probably the Victoria and Alfred waterfront. It's um, a big complex. Uh, it's a working harbour. It's the oldest working harbour in South Africa. I think it is actually officially the most visited attraction in the whole of the country. I think 24 million people visit it every year. And from there, once you've kind of explored and maybe even have your lunch there, um, you can then get on the ferry and go across to Robben Island, which is a UNESCO um, heritage site. And a lot of people may be familiar with it from the fact that it was where former President Nelson Mandela spent 18 of his 27 years in prison. You go there and they do a tour of the island, a tour of the prison. And it's fascinating. It's a deep part of our history and a part of the apartheid history as well in South Africa. I believe that getting tickets is not immediately evident like it's a little bit complicated to get tickets can you explain about do, that do you mean the tickets to to robin island i can't give a definitive answer other than having to go to the vna and go to the ticket office you if you're going up table mountain you can book in advance and you can get your tickets in advance i'm not sure what's happened there for anyone watching this and listening to this i would say at the moment the best advice is to to go there on the day and, you know, again, it, it's hard to predict because, you know, you may go on a day that's very popular and obviously the, the ferries only have so much capacity. But, um, but yeah, it is strange. Yeah, it's, it's really strange when we've had our travellers that have come to South Africa and, uh, and Botswana. It's always been a little bit like logistically challenging trying to figure out, I guess, because it's an island and, you know, you're very sort of limited by departure times and it takes a bit longer because you know obviously you have to get there but the boat ride itself is absolutely gorgeous isn't absolutely it? you get that whole kind of panoramic view of table mountain and the atlantic seaboard and it's it's photo opportunity galore it really is it's well worth a visit just for the history and the background of of everything that you know nelson mandela and all of the apartheid activists kind of you know struggled for during those years so Mm. I, I have been to Robin Island once and I was very surprised to see that there were actually some penguins on Robin Island too when, when we went at least. Yeah, absolutely. No, sometimes <laughs> you do find them there and then obviously a lot of the, the Cape Fur Seal, has, you know, they've got kind of like a colony. Oh, as, yes. Now I remember. Yeah. So no, there's lots of wildlife, lots of bird life. After we've done the Robin Island excursion, yeah. 
what would you recommend? We're probably getting towards the end of our day say, in terms of things to do. Absolutely. I think that is probably about as much as you would be able to fit into the, the actual day. And you'll probably be quite exhausted by then as well. And I've done it with friends and family and guests that have come to Cape Town. Everyone's pretty exhausted by then. So it's then back on the ferry, back to the V&A, and then maybe back to your accommodation or going straight out for an early dinner, perhaps, and before getting a good night's rest, because then you've got the second day to look forward to. So why don't you tell us about day two? Hopefully we've had a good night's rest. Absolutely. A good night's rest. I'm sure you would have done. I think you'd be exhausted from day one. But yeah, day two, I think it's important to do what we call the Cape Peninsula. So it gives you a really great idea of our wonderful coastline that we have here. So I would depart Cape Town and I would go to perhaps maybe somewhere like Colk Bay or Simon's Town. Colk Bay is a, a fishing village. It's still an operational fishing, fishing village, but it's a, a beautiful community there. And there's lots of lovely places to stop and have like a, a vegan breakfast and grab a coffee and maybe just like watch some of the boats going in and out of the harbour. It's very picturesque. And then from there, I would, if you're either a Colt Bay or Simon's Town, then from there, it's just a short journey down to Boulder's Beach. And Boulder's Beach is where you will find the African penguins. Um, it's one of two land-based uh, colonies that we have in the Western Cape. So one is Boulder's Beach and one is about 150 odd kilometers outside of Cape Town in a place called Betty's Bay. But this is the best place to see the penguins if you're visiting Cape Town. It's a lovely setup. There's viewing decks and everything, but it isn't invasive to the penguins at all. And, you know, they're obviously kind of used to kind of seeing people at the same time. You know, you are at a respectful distance. So, and you just get to see them in all of their waddling glory. I mean, it's it's just wonderful. Um, there's a lot though that's being done at the moment to try and increase the uh, the amount of birds that we have there and stuff. So, um, but that is a wonderful experience, and lots of people want to include that in their itinerary when they come to visit Cape Town. And after there, I would head straight to the Cape of Good Hope, and which is still part of the Table Mountain National Park. And there you will see a whole plethora of wildlife. I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are six floral kingdoms in the world. And one of them is in Cape Town. And it's the smallest of the six floral kingdoms, but it is one of the most biodiverse of all of them. It's the only one that's contained in a single country. And of about 9,000 species, which is huge, that we have in the Cape Floral Kingdom, yeah, there's nowhere else in the world that you'll find these plants. So, so you'll see a lot of that at the Cape of Good Hope. And that is also where Cape Point is, which is the southernmost tip of Africa. It's worth mentioning that that's not where the two oceans meet. Some people uh, are told that, you know, the two oceans meet at Cape Point, and that's not actually quite correct. It's, it's another, uh, about, again, another 150 to 200 kilometers up the south coast to a place called Cape Agullas. And that's where the two, the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean, that's where they meet. But um, yeah, Cape Point is the southernmost tip of Africa. And the, the, the scenery that you will see in the Cape of Good Hope is just, again, spectacular. And you'll see the chukma baboons and you'll see ostrich and you'll see different kind of buck. And yeah, lots of wonderful, wonderful wildlife. It's a real experience. It, yeah, I, I agree. I think it's very often like the sort of the gateway drug to South Africa as a whole in terms of the wildlife. Could you explain a little bit about what the landscape is like? So uh, the coastline is very rugged. It's very choppy. Even before the Dutch settlers arrived here, the Portuguese came to Cape Town and it was, um, it was Bartholomew Diaz who basically originally referred to Cape Town or the Cape coastline as the Cape of Storms because historically there have been so many ships throughout history that have been wrecked. So it's a very, very treacherous, rocky kind of coastline, but with that comes immense beauty as well. Um, and this is what's really, really interesting as well about, about Cape Town and its surrounds. We have such diverse landscapes, you know, we have the, the beautiful beautiful kind of fame boss of, of all the, the Cape Floral Kingdom, which you see in Table Mountain and through some of the Western Cape. And then you've got, you know, the Cape Winelands, you've got further afield, the uh, Klein, Klein Karua, which is kind of a lot more arid. So 
it's, it's really beautiful and it's really diverse as well. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. I think a lot of people might think, well, I'm not really interested in botany, for example, like why am I so interested in going to see this? But I'm not super interested in botany, but this vegetation really has to be seen to be to be appreciated. It's so beautiful. There's very few trees. It's lots of shrubs. It's this beautiful protea, which I think is the national Absolutely, flower yeah. of South Africa. I mean, if you're familiar with some Australian botany, there are some similarities, I think. But really, it's just so unique and gorgeous and you know you have to look closely to to see how unique it is but it, it's so special absolutely i agree it's, it's 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 visually spectacular and also as well it's all the smells that come from these plants there's certain days that i'll be driving around or i have the window open you're driving you just the car is just filled with this kind of this scent of nature and it is just so extraordinary but yeah you're absolutely right the the king protea is our national flower i was actually quite interested to learn that there's actually more species of protea itself actually in australia than there is in south africa but even though we have more species in general in the cape floral kingdom uh, apparently there's more, even more species than there is in mm. in the western cape so it's interesting i guess it, you know when when the earth was split millions and millions of years ago i guess you know certain things kind of traveled and whatever so yeah for sure so after we've done our visit of the penguins and we've gone and checked out cape peninsula what do we do next i would say you're probably coming towards the end of your day but in going driving back the way that we've come down to uh the cape of good hope we're going back a slightly different way and we will take in chapman's peak drive which is voted i think most of the time the most spectacular coastal road in the world the views are insane they really are and you have to again include that in your itinerary um it's actually only just reopened the last couple of days we had a, a really bad storm about three weeks ago two three weeks ago now and there was obviously different landslides and we lost vegetation and different trees and everything but yeah it's up and running again now hopefully when guests are here they get to experience it because again it is just photo opportunity galore it really is a spectacular just, you know, scenery of just vast, vast ocean, just until as far as the eye can see, it's, it's gorgeous. So. I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. So we're back in Cape Town for the night and in the morning, we're going to do some wine country. Talk to us about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So I think this is why I like doing this as the third day, because it kind of slows down the pace. You've been really busy for the first two days doing the history of Cape Town and South Africa and kind of going down to, you know, the Cape Peninsula and everything. And now you can just kind of just sit back and relax a little bit. But we have oh, an extraordinary kind of wine region. I kind of focus a lot of my attention when I'm doing tours in the Stellenbosch wine region. Uh, it was the first wine route that was created, I think, in 1971. And there's about 150 wineries that you can choose from to visit. And that is just one of our numerous kind of wine routes that we have. And I think what's just really, really wonderful about it is just to be able to explore some of the Cape Dutch architecture that exists on these wine farms, some of the buildings, which is really, really quite exquisite. And again, you're spoilt for views because there's mountains all around. It's very diverse. You've got vineyards that are going on for days and it's just it's just beautiful. So, yeah, it's a great opportunity to kind of slow down and just Take your way around, you know, whether you're with a guide like myself or whether you're self-driving. Obviously, you have to have a designated driver because, you know, there's a zero, uh, zero uh, tolerance to drink driving. Uh, we also have our own grape here that was created in South Africa called Pinotage. And anyone that's watching this that's really into wine may have heard of it, but it's not incredibly well known. But that was created at Stellenbosch University and it's a, a cross-pollination of Pinot Noir and Hermitage that creates pinotage and a lot of people just love to be able to experience and try that when they come and visit. Yeah, something that really struck me when we did a day tour of the vineyards, we at that time, it was quite a while ago now, we hired a guide and they drove us around so that we could indulge in the wines a little bit. And just some of these vineyards are just incredible estates in terms of, you know, just how fancy they are and, and, and how beautiful they are and how well set up they are for visitors and they often have restaurants attached. 
Absolutely. This is what's so wonderful to be able to taste wine where it's actually grown and then be able to have lunch on a wine farm. And we're so, so spoiled for choice, really. It's what I try to include with my tour specifically is kind of, like I said, trying to incorporate maybe some of the Cape Dutch architecture with some of the more modern wineries that exist and different scenery. It's so diverse. So some people don't like red wines, so they'll focus more on the whites or vice versa. And, and even if you're not into wine at all, I mean, there's plenty of wine farms that actually do non-alcoholic wine tastings or they'll just do, um, you know, certain pairings or whatever else with you know, either confectionery. Um, I'm, I'm not actually aware of any any that are doing any kind of like vegan, you know, pairings in terms of, I actually know there is one wine farm, Fairview Wine Farm, that does a vegan cheese uh, wine pairing as well. So that's also an opportunity there for plant-based travellers. Fantastic. And something that I've noticed recently and something that I think is really interesting is that there are starting to be some black-owned wineries as well throughout South Africa, um, throughout this wine area, which I think is really, really interesting. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, that's a lot of the reason why these beautiful big farm estates have become the way, you know, beautiful big wine estates is based on the huge amount of labour that has been used, usually black labour, to create these fancy wine estates. And it's been really heartening to see that there are some black owned wineries as well that, you know, I think people should seek out. Absolutely. I agree. This is what is so extraordinary, really. If you think about, you know, our democracy and our constitution, it's only been since 1994, which is in the grand scheme of thing, no time whatsoever for things to change. There's still a long way to go in certain aspects. It's, it's lovely that you mentioned that because there are now more black owned businesses, which is incredibly important. We're in South Africa, so, it, you know, people should be given and shown these opportunities and also educated so that they know how to run business. You know, you can't just, you know, say, well, there's a farm. And so there's lots of opportunity, I think, now for these businesses and business owners to really develop their skills and for opportunities for everyone, regardless of race, regardless of orientation. I, I agree with you. I think there is definitely a shift there. It's exactly as it should be, which is which is great. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I am one of these people that will travel for vegan food. So are you able to speak to any places where travellers might be able to have vegan versions of South African food? Or sometimes I think this is really interesting. A lot of places they're starting to incorporate ingredients from South Africa are those plants that we've talked a little bit about as well and and just great vegan food options in general can you speak to any of those in the places that we would be driving through or past on this three-day itinerary absolutely yeah we really are spoiled for our vegan options in Cape Town and then there are some that really cater incredibly well to vegans. So we have had some casualties recently where, you know, places have closed and I think it's just been as it has a lot around the world. It's, you know, it's what's happened after COVID and people just trying to find their feet again. It hasn't quite happened. And also the cost of living, but um, which is affecting, I think, everyone globally. But in terms of, you know, the, the vegan scene in Cape Town, you really are sport for choice. There's, there's a great place called the Sunshine Food Co, which I just love going to. They do these wonderful, really healthy wraps and burgers. It's a very, very tiny, tiny place in Three Anchor Bay, Seapoint area. Um, and it's owned by a guy, a Zimbabwean guy. He, he grows his own microgreens and the microgreens really kind of play a huge role in the burgers and, and the wraps and everything. And it, he always does this delicious side of yellow dal. And it's just, it's such a, a strange combination to have like with a burger or a wrap, but it just works beautifully. So I'm a huge fan of that. Um, but in terms of kind of like South African dishes that are kind of like veganized, there isn't anywhere I'd say specifically. There have been occasions where I've gone to places and like we have a uh, thing in dishes like called uh, babua tea, which is like traditionally like a minced beef dish that's that topped with egg. But it, there's a vegan version of that, which is which I've tried before and it's wonderful. I, I know the Plant Cafe in Camps Bay, actually, I'm sure they do the, the vegan babua tea. And, and that's 
also got all the beautiful um, Cape Malay spices and everything, because obviously we have a, a big heritage of, you know, Cape Malay cooking and everything here, which Baburti tea um, that, that kind of originates from. And then you have something called Malva pudding, which is kind of like a, uh, like a sticky sponge with custard that I've had as well. But, you know, aside from um, South African cuisine and dishes, there's a great restaurant called Aiko Sushi, which does a phenomenal vegan sushi. Uh, it has three or four pages on its menu of just solely vegan sushi. And it's, I went there recently for my birthday and it was just such a treat. It's such a wonderful place. Um, and then of course you can get all your, you know, there's lots of places that, you know, cater, like I said before, like with burgers and different things like that. Um, pizzas, you can, you know, you can always find. Um, so yeah, we really are, you won't go hungry at all. There's probably a, a few more kind of um, fast, junk food, fast food type of vegan restaurants. There's great fine dining restaurants as well that cater to, you know, the vegan clientele and also vegan high teas. I mean, some of our five-star hotels also, the Mount Nelson, the 12 Apostles Hotel, they all cater to uh, vegan, vegan high teas, which is fantastic. I've been a number of times and they're just exquisite. The pastries and the sandwiches that they create are just really extraordinary. I love that. Yes, we went to the Mount Nelson. I think it was on Christmas Day, actually. It was between um, what two of our trips and we had some travellers that had just finished one of our trips and they were hanging around for a couple of days. And then there was the travellers who'd arrived early for the next trip. And we all met and we went to Mount Nelson. And it was incredible. Like, it's a ridiculous number of choices of tea in this absolutely beautiful setting and the service was incredible yeah. it was so much it's fun. such a special place it's a wonderful building the grounds i mean it's steeped in history it's just yeah it's it is a, a must place to visit i would say you know and we and then we've got other places like we you know we've got a solely kind of um vegan donut a shop called grumpy and run which is incredibly popular and um, we've got another place called uh, eat ditto which is completely vegan and they do vegan waffles and vegan ice cream so anyone that's got a sweet tooth you have to definitely check out those places as well so a really famous thing that i think there is a vegan version of i'm not quite sure where to get it but it's a famous south african sub sandwich can you tell us about that yeah and what's in so it? that's the gatsby i think that you're probably referring to so it's like this huge um almost like a baguette but it's it's not as crusty as a baguette it's softer and it's filled with fries and obviously seitan or whatever your kind of filling is and you usually have to share it with at least one person if not maybe two other people otherwise you have to go with an absolutely enormous appetite but um you yeah, know it's kind of like a local favorite it's a bit of a, a stalwart on the culinary scene i suppose of, of, of cape town i love it i love it yeah i i did not know that it was meant to be shared and i bought <laughs> one and got it delivered to the hotel at uber eats and i can eat a lot but there was just no way that i yeah. was going to be able to eat all of that it was Really yeah, crazy. I think people have made the same mistake many, many times. So, Have you got any other favourite places in Cape Town? Uh, there's a wonderful place I love going to for breakfast and lunch as well, but I love it for their breakfast. And that's a place called Conscious Kitchen, which is on Clough Street. There's actually quite a lot of eateries around Clough Street. That's where Eat Ditto is that I mentioned a moment ago. There's also this new Indian place that's opened up called Vardi Velu, which is up the top of Kluv Street. And it's not a completely vegan restaurant, but they have some excellent vegan options. And I just love it for the ambiance as well. It's like such a nice room to have dinner in and it's got a like lovely energy to it. And they have a nice wine list and it's, but it's not like fancy. It's not like over the top, but it's a really great place. So I love going there for dinner for, if I'm in the mood for, for Indian food. Um, but yeah, and like I said, I mentioned about the sushi. I mean, I love that as well. It's very cool. But if you are going down towards, as I mentioned before, say towards like um, Colt Bay and Simonstown area, there's also a place before that called Musenberg, which is very famous for surfers and surfing. It's where a lot of people go. There's a cafe there called Hang Ten, which has, again, wonderful like vegan muffins and um, they do like a wonderful uh, carrot locks. Um, bagel like for breakfast and stuff like that there's also a place in Musenberg called the Commons which 
Again, I think it's vegetarian, vegan, so lots and lots of brilliant options to have along there as well. I would say for anyone that's visiting Cape Town, it's a website and a Instagram page called Cape Town Vegan. So for any visitor that's listening to this or inspired to come to Cape Town, definitely check out capetownvegan.com because it's a directory of all eateries and restaurants and, you know, it's listed by suburb, it's listed by whatever you're in the mood for, like, you know, eatery by Indian food or Mexican food or pizza or burgers or whatever it happens to be. So it's a fantastic resource, really is. So getting around a new city can be challenging. So how would you describe like the ease of transportation and navigation for visitors exploring Cape Town? Are there any tips that you can share? It's very easy to get around. I mean, like a lot of um, modern cities, you know, we have Uber, which I think a lot of people use and it's reliable and it's safe. We also, we do have a public transport system. Um, We have uh, the My City Bus, which basically services most of the inner city. And I know for a fact that tourists have absolutely used that, you know, to get to different places. I mean, the network isn't so far but, um, but it's good if you're just kind of like staying local and whatever. And also the train service is now going through a bit of a redevelopment, which is really, really exciting. And it's very, very cost effective. So if anyone wanted to go into Musenberg or to Cork Bay, they can actually get a train from Cape Town Central Station and they can get the train down. But there aren't many throughout the day. They kind of service more the first thing in the morning and then later on in the afternoon. But, um, if you're going for a day trip, then you can obviously you know easily kind of coincide that and it's it's safe okay so we've got these new trains where the carriages are kind of car um, compartmentalized so it's like one long carriage where you can see from one end to the other the security on the trains even i'd say within about the last 18 months we're really starting to get somewhere with it again but um i would say absolutely like you can either use private taxis or ubers i mean they're 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 cost effective they're easy to get around and and i think it's something that a lot of people are familiar with now yeah yeah for sure a question that i have about the public transportation options that's really cool that that is improving. How are those accessible in terms of like payment and knowing the schedules? Is is it all integrated with Google Maps? Because sometimes the timetable is, you know, you need a special app to know when the service is coming and, and that kind of thing. Like, how do you navigate all of that? Yeah, we're not particularly, at least to my knowledge, we're not particularly kind of linked up to any kind of one app. So, I mean, when I use a train, I just like hop online and I think I go on to something like capetowntrains.com or so. I think that's the website, something similar to that. Um, and it basically has the timetable on there as to, you know, whatever direction you're going or, and, you know, it, that, and that's always been fair. That's always been actually very, accurate whenever I've used that. In terms of the My City bus, I do I think you do have to buy a card and then you have to load money onto it. So that's something that, you know, maybe people visiting Mayfield is a bit too much hassle or depending on if they're here for maybe a couple of weeks, then it's probably a good idea because then they can get around. But there is there is actually a My City app for the buses. So there's an app that exists for that. And that will give you all of your routes and your schedules and your timetables. And I think that it's quite accurate in the sense that if there's a delay, if there's been an accident somewhere and there's a roadblock or something's happened, then we kind of say that it's going to be delayed. So... So yeah, so that is available. So let's delve a little bit into your business, which is Vegan Tours Cape Town. What inspired you to create this service and how do you, what do you do on your tours to make sure that these are kind of like a vegan experience? So I was inspired to create Vegan Tours Cape Town because based on research that I was doing, nothing really existed for the independent traveler that was kind of geared towards veganism and plant-based, you know, tourists and guests visiting Cape Town. So, you know, after, like I say, the research and everything, I was like, I I know for a fact that obviously vegans and plant-based tourists are coming to Cape Town. So they're obviously probably having to do a lot of their own research and, and, and trying to create their own itineraries. So I decided to launch this business because some people don't want the hassle with that. They want to be able to come on holiday. They want to be able to hire a qualified tour guide that you know can show them around that can explain all of their history and the culture and take them to where they want to go 
Um, I'd say that so far, like my main tour or my flagship tour is the private vegan wine tour. So it's a full day tour. I pick guests up at around 9.30 in the morning and then we drive out towards Stellenbosch and then we go to our first wine estate. And at the first estate, I'd like to include a cellar tour because I think that's something quite interesting and something quite unique where you know, lots of people drink wine, but they don't really know how it goes from grape to being in the bottle to then enjoying it kind of thing. So it's not an incredibly intense experience, but it's just like a very brief overview of winemaking. And as I said, how it goes from the grapevine into the bottle and all of the process in between. So we start off with that and then we do some wine tasting at the first farm. We then go to a second farm and this is probably my favorite farm I think that I've discovered in uh, Stellenbosch. It's called Die Morgenson and they basically play classical music in the vineyards 24-7. And it's because it, the winemakers believe that because the vine is alive, like anything that's alive responds to music in terms of the vibration and how it makes it feel. So, you know, in terms of studies and whether they can prove that it improves the wine or not, I don't think that um, they can necessarily go so far to kind of say that. But I think it's really, really interesting what they're doing there. And I just love the idea behind that. And I think they were also inspired by there was a um, there was a test that was done. I, I can't remember what it was what it was called now, but um, they basically asked people to um, to name their five favorite songs. And then the, the songs would be played and other songs would be played in between. And they would be poured wine and they would taste wine and then they would grade the wine and say whether it was a four out of a 10 or six out of 10 or 10 out of 10. And it basically turns out that the wine was um, completely the same throughout, but what changed people's opinion of it was whether they were listening to their favorite song or whether they were listening to something they didn't like, if they didn't like heavy metal or whatever it happened to be, that they would change their opinion of what they were tasting. So there was there's something that was linked into that with their their idea and their wanting to place this classical music in the vineyard. And it's just so extraordinary. It's such a beautiful place to visit. So that's where the second wine tasting takes place. And then from there, we go on to have lunch at our uh, third wine farm. And there's a four course uh, vegan harvest table that is prepared for guests. And I was there literally with some guests just on Sunday and it was just wonderful. Really, really great food, um, very well thought out, very well considered. And it's a wine farm called Warwick Wine Estate. They offer vegan picnics as well. I think they're one of the wine farms that are really trying to put veganism on the map as far as wineries go, which is really, really exciting. And then we finish off the afternoon with our fourth uh, wine farm, wine estate, and it's usually either Takara or Delaire Graf. And I usually like finishing there because it's quite different to some of the previous farms. So De Morganson has a Cape Dutch homestead, so it's very picturesque and it's very pretty and it's very uh, historical, whereas the final two, uh, or Takara or Delaire Graf, is a bit more modern, but it has these spectacular views that surround it. So I know for a fact that Neetlingshof, which is our first farm in De Morganson, they don't use any pesticides, they don't spray anything whatsoever. I love that. I love that. Oh, that sounds like such a enjoyable day yeah, yeah it's great and then i get people back to their accommodation around 5 5 30 and then the evening is theirs if they feel that they want to then go out for dinner yeah and soon i will be introducing probably a cape peninsula tour with some of the places that i've, I've mentioned already in the podcast but that will then also incorporate a vegan high tea because i just thought that'd be quite a nice thing you know to offer and then customized tours. I mean, if anyone has either been to Cape Town before and there's things that they haven't seen, or if they've never been to Cape Town, but there's things that they really, really want to include in an itinerary, whether it's a, you know, I want to go to Boulder's Beach, but I also want to make sure that I go here for lunch or I go here for breakfast, then I can create that as well. So I'm very open to, to you know, creating itineraries for people based on their preferences. So. I love that. And I'm guessing you usually take people around by car? Yeah, absolutely. If you go to my website, there's availability for either, I, I like to include solo travellers as well. I don't want to exclude anyone as much as possible. So there is, um, you can either book for one person or four people. 
uh, well, one, per, one person, two people, three people or four people is on the website. And then anything over and above that, then if you just drop me an email, depending on, you know, what your requirements are, then obviously price and everything would be dependent on that because it would depend on the size of the vehicle and how many people and everything. So, so yeah. I love it. I love it. Fantastic. Can you tell us about any exciting future projects or developments that you have for this fledgling business? Yeah, I mean, my main aim at the moment is to obviously try and build as many relationships with business owners that exist in Cape Town that are aligned to either veganism or plant-based diets and to try and kind of build, like I say, build those relationships and try and see how I can incorporate my business into theirs and theirs into mine and just basically see where that goes. Like I said, it's very much in its infancy, but I'm very excited about the potential of it. We know that globally veganism is on the rise and, you know, now we're through the pandemic, travel is, you know, very much back on the on people's agenda. What I hope more than anything is that people do find me through their Googling and through their research and that, you know, if anyone needs even just general advice, you know, to basically come to me and just kind of like ask exactly, you know, any, if anyone needs any help, then I'm open to that. But in terms of where the business is going, I would love to obviously employ people as well. I mean, at the moment, it's just myself that's running it. But to be able to have other vegan tour guides and and create a business and create, you know, something where I'm actually able to employ someone that has a family and that that would really be special that would really be awesome i love it i love it so a big concern that often bubbles up for people when they are thinking about going to south africa and cape town is safety i will say that our travelers you know they're really excited about coming to cape town but this is something that bubbles up a lot um and i think it is a definite concern a real concern it's not just something that's sort of been blown out of proportion you know Cape Town does have and many South African cities unfortunately do have a problem with crime so can you provide some insights into the safety of Cape Town and maybe any tips or resources for travelers to ensure a worry-free experience sure i'm really glad that you've asked this question because you're absolutely right I, I think that probably possibly is the number one reason why maybe more people don't visit south africa and they don't visit cape town um and i can understand why obviously our statistics aren't particularly good compared to some countries but what i will say is that i think as far as the country goes cape town is probably one of the safest places really it is I mean, in 12 years of living here, I've never personally been a victim of physical crime or violent crime whatsoever. And I think a lot of it is down to the individual just to remain aware, as you would be in any kind of big city where there is a big high density of tourists around. So there's always going to be opportunists. Um, so my, my top tips would be the same whether you're in Cape Town or whether you're in Barcelona or London or Buenos Aires, you know, just be mindful about waving anything around that's valuable. If you've got like a fancy mobile phone or a lovely camera or, or anything like that, just be very mindful about what you're doing and just try it. I think what's difficult is to try and remain aware of your surroundings because when you're looking at some of these fantastic views and you're trying to take in something, you obviously you're in that moment and sometimes you're not always aware of who's around you or what's around you. But in terms of waving around valuables, that would be my number one thing. I would also say be careful about, you know, don't walk on, around alone or in small groups at night because, there's, again, there's always going to be opportunists. Be very careful when you're at ATMs, you know, not to get distracted. You know, there's always people that are trying to, you know, distract you and trying to either see your PIN number or something's going on. And so I, a lot of it is common sense, but um, admittedly, you know, we, like I say, we, we don't have particularly great statistics when it does come to crime but just to reiterate i've never personally been a victim of crime and actually none of my close friends or family that are here you know the media unfortunately does perpetuate a certain situation if it's an agenda that suits a certain media outlet then obviously that's gonna 
go a certain direction. Anyone that's listening to this and anyone that is inspired to want to visit Cape Town, I would, you know, I would say just be brave about it. I'm almost certain that you won't regret it. I think it will probably change your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, unfortunately, a couple of our travellers, they ended up being victims of crime when they came on our trips. It was before we had actually met oh, them. Um, and despite our suggestions about how to, you know, look after themselves, um, luckily it wasn't violent. It was, you know, purely a financial loss. Yeah. One traveller had their phone pickpocketed from them. So again, it's a really great idea to make sure that your phone is, I mean, I always keep things like in front of me in a very well zipped up thing and just make sure that I have it all of the time. So that was extremely unfortunate that she had her phone stolen. And another one, he he was a victim of a scam and and, um, this was extremely upsetting to hear about and luckily his bank was going to cover these charges I think I can't remember entirely the details but when he was very tired and disoriented he and again I I can't remember the details but I'm I'm sure he was a very savvy person but you know scams can happen to even the most savvy people but somehow he ended up going to an ATM and and withdrawing money and he wasn't familiar with what it was all worth and he ended up sort of giving this money to someone to pay for something very small Mm. it was a very strange thing but again I think it's just you know don't let it stop you from going to South Africa I think that you know just be aware that these things happen and also I think it's important to say that you know hotels and tourist businesses and restaurants they're really well set up to look after their clients so whether that means that you know there's very good security to get into hotels and things like that you can always ask a restaurant to call a trusted cab to get you home in the evening these kinds of things are going to help and I will say that whenever we go to South Africa I always am very conscious of just doing a little bit of a security brush up in terms of like, you know, the access to, you know, bank accounts and credit cards and just making sure I've got two factor authentication set up and that I've got fingerprint access for my phone and all of these things really to just make sure that I'm, you know, gonna be protecting myself. This is just good sense for life, really. Absolutely. I mean, it really is. And also, like, do wherever you're you know traveling and visiting you know have um photocopies of your passport and have photocopies of your credit cards or different things that are that are left somewhere separate and so that you have have that you know in case your passport is stolen because obviously that's going to be a huge hassle in trying to you know navigate that while you're in a, a foreign country and depending on where you're from and where your consulate is and having to make contact and and all of that but um no, I'm glad that you've said all that. It is just to kind of be a bit mindful about where you're going. A lot of it is common sense. And I mean this in the nicer sense. I think some people, like when we go on holiday, because we just want to let go and forget and be frivolous. And, you know, sometimes common sense does go out the window a bit. Yes. Can you share one personal highlight or favourite men- memory from your time living in Cape Town? Sure. Um one thing that really sticks with me is when you 2 came to play at the Cape Town Stadium and it was part of their, I think it was called their 360 tour where they had this big spider type of set in, you know, that they were touring around the world and it was fantastic. I was here and the tickets had gone online before I'd arrived in Cape Town and it was just you, you just couldn't get a ticket for love nor money. So I was so desperate to see them. I love you too. I'd never seen them live. And so I just thought, you know, coming from London, I know there's always people outside venues maybe trying to sell tickets. And I was like, I really want to see them. So if I have to pay a little bit above and beyond, you know, the actual selling price of the ticket, then I will. I'm prepared to do so. So I went and stood outside the stadium and everyone's going in, everyone's going in. And, and all of a sudden I just heard this voice. Someone just said, do you need a ticket? And I was like, yes, yes, I do, I do, I do. Do, I, do you have one? They said, yeah, there you go. And I was like, okay, how, uh, uh, how much do you want for it? Oh, no, 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 it doesn't, don't worry about it. I was like, 
no, please, how much do you want for it? And they're like, oh, no, don't worry, my friend can come. You're, you're welcome to have it. So that was an extraordinary moment because then I got to experience U2 and it was a phenomenal concert and I just loved it. But I think what it says more than anything and looking back on it and what I've realised is that is so much about what the South African person is like. They are such warm, hospitable people. They didn't want anything from me. They just were happy. They didn't want this ticket to go to waste. And I really think it's one of the biggest assets of South Africa is its people. They're incredibly resilient. The country historically has been through so, so much. You'd think that people would just be just so fed up. And yes, they are fed up some days, especially with load shedding and things like that. But their spirit, the South African spirit, is like nothing that I have ever experienced in anywhere that I've ever traveled in my life. Really, it's, they're, they're just such beautiful, warm, hospitable people. And I hope that anyone that does visit Cape Town will experience that. They may not end up with a ticket to a concert, but I do hope that they will experience this, this wonderful warmth from the, from the South African. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a really interesting, fascinating, diverse country and city and I would wholeheartedly recommend people to check it out uh, one day when Seb and I are no longer tied to where we are at the moment we have an elderly cat but we really hope to spend a really good slab of time in South Africa and Cape Town because there is just so much to see and do in this really amazing country so you know I want to thank you so much Matt for taking the time to be on the podcast I really appreciate it would you mind telling us how people can get in contact with you to find out more about your vegan tours and um, maybe follow you on social media as well I would love people to know and I would love people to get in contact with me so um, you can go to my website which is vegantourscapetown.com and my social media on Instagram is Vegan Tours Cape Town, as well as Facebook, Vegan Tours Cape Town. So if you go to my website, at the moment you'll see that we've got the wine tour that's on there. And then you've got the choice of that or the customized tour. If someone, as I mentioned before, does want to do something quite specific that I haven't actually created yet. Um, but I will be launching um, a Cape Peninsula tour uh, very soon. So that will also be on the website. But yeah, check out my website. And if anyone, like I said, wants to just touch base and they're coming to Cape Town, they just want a, a little bit of advice, you know, I'm happy to offer that. I don't expect anything from it. I'm just, I, I just want people to come here and I want people to have just the most wonderful time because it really is a mind-blowingly beautiful, wonderful city. I love it. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you for taking the time to be on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Bridie. And thanks for your time as well. And yeah, I hope you enjoy your next visit to South Africa. Yeah, I'll be there uh, in just over a year. We'll have to have a coffee or a sandwich. Maybe we can share a Gatsby. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Bridie.